This is Fresh Tracks Weekly. Well, I've been a little busy the last few weeks. Some work, some play. Honestly, a lot of it kind of blurs together, which I guess is a really good thing. Very fortunate to have the job that I do, be able to play a lot in the outside. But anyway, I am back in the office this week. Michael and Jace, however, are out of the office. They're out chasing bears, so no fishing corner this week. You're stuck with me from uh, my fishing realm. Fishing kitchen, rather, I guess today is what we're in. But I guess also calling it fishing, not entirely accurate. I've been corrected before. What I really did is went snagging. We went paddle fishing. The only way to catch a paddle fish is via snagging with giant surf casting rods, big dot hooks, and a lead weight. You throw it out in the river and you just snag and you snag and you snag over and over again until you hopefully luck into a fish. Pretty barbaric uh, method for acquiring fish, but been doing it for years. It's a lot of fun and they're very tasty. Uh, we did end up filling all of our tags, so that was super exciting. It took a long time, but yeah, paddle fishing is a blast. They're just these crazy prehistoric looking dinosaur fish. If you want to learn a lot more about them, you should check out our Anything Goes episode on them that we did last year. I'll put a link in the video description. It's one of my favorite episodes that we've made, so check that out if you have time. Also this weekend, we did manage to get some other fishing in. We picked up a few catfish, including my personal best with 15 pounds for a channel catfish, which I think is pretty big. I'm sure they get much larger, but yeah, I was stoked on that. And all in all, it was a good time on the river, just hanging out with everyone, eating good food, catching some fish, getting really sore from snagging over and over again. Yeah, paddlefish camp, always a good time. With that, we'll jump right into some news. In the last episode, we talked about the corner crossing case in Wyoming and how the judge ruled in favor of the four hunters dismissing the trespass charges against them. A little update concerning that case, there was the one remaining charge concerning a GPS point that was on private property. That has also been dropped by the ranch owner, so that is no longer a part of this. That being said, everyone is still expecting an appeal to the original trespassing charge related to corner crossing. Another interesting tidbit that arose related to corner crossing, soon after that ruling in Wyoming, Dustin Temple, the new director of Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, said in a news release, quote, corner crossing remains unlawful in Montana, and Montana should continue to obtain permission from the adjoining landowners before crossing corners from one piece of public to another, end quote. So this statement has fired up a lot of people because historically it's always been this gray area within Montana as to whether or not corner crossing was legal and Montana FWP had remained fairly neutral on the topic. Several individuals have contested that statement by saying that it's simply incorrect to say that corner crossing is unlawful. There is speculation that this might be a new tone taken by the agency before if you were to ask an agency personnel whether or not corner crossing was legal you'd kind of get a well, we're not really sure. We advise against it. So to take a stance that it is unlawful is pretty bold. We'll have to see how this all shakes out and if this continues to be a contentious issue. Another update on a previous story, that case in Colorado where an angler had sued a private landowner for restricting his access to the Arkansas River and harassing him by throwing rocks. This angler had argued that the river was navigable when Colorado became a state and therefore should be open to public use to wade and angle. This case had raised hopes of public access advocates as it had potential to improve stream access laws in the state, but unfortunately the judge ruled against the angler, basically saying that the angler did not have standing in the case and therefore no right to stand in the river. The moral of the story to me anyway is that Colorado has a long history of stream access issues and what exactly you can and cannot do within the rivers continues to change over the years and it's almost a case by case basis. At one point long ago, the court decided that the water was public, but the public users were not allowed to float through private property. But then later a case determined that rafters and kayakers could pass through private property as long as they did not touch the riverbed or shore. Mark Squillance, a professor of natural law, was quoted saying that in order for the navigable by right argument to last in Colorado, that somebody will need to wade into a Colorado riverbed and either be charged with trespass or assaulted by a landowner to have legal standing to argue the river is public property. In this case, that did not apply. Randy has a little more insight into this for the deeper dive in the second half of the episode. In several previous episodes, we mentioned the fight for Montana's marijuana tax revenue with SB 442 
and this fight is still not over. It was a back and forth in the legislature for quite a while, with eventually a bill being pushed forward that seemed to be a good compromise, with some of the money still going to Habitat Montana, for which it was initially promised for, along with going to various other things like county road maintenance, and everyone kind of got their little piece of the pie. But as we mentioned in that past episode, Governor Greg Gianforte vetoed the bill in the last minute, leaving some confusion as whether or not the legislature could vote to override that veto. Because of the confusion, Wild Montana and Montana Wildlife Federation filed a lawsuit in an attempt to declare the veto invalid until they allow the lawmakers to vote on the matter. Also, the Montana Association of Counties filed a similar lawsuit making similar claims. Both plaintiffs argue that the failure to remedy the situation could establish a loophole that governors could use to exploit in the future to avoid veto overrides. Gene Forte's staff said that the governor's technical and policy concerns with SB 442 are well documented and that the bill glaringly omits an appropriation and fails to fund itself and sets a dangerous precedent by authorizing state resources to go to local road maintenance. So the saga continues. We'll have to see if anything comes from either of these lawsuits. In Missouri, at the Swan Lake National Wildlife Refuge, they just announced that it will be suspending its waterfowl hunting program indefinitely due to staffing shortages. There was speculation as to whether or not there was nefarious intent behind this hunting closure, but from the sounds of it, the refuge simply doesn't have enough staff to run the program. So far, there has not been a ton of information released on this, but the refuge manager did say that it is just a suspension and they hope to get the necessary personnel that they can get the hunting program back up and running. It is the federal government, so it'll happen at a snail's pace, but hopefully that manager is right and they'll get the hunting back up and running before too long. A recent study has shown that ticks may contribute to the spread of chronic wasting disease. CWD, of course, is starting to have a significant impact on deer populations across the country, and management is trying to keep up with ways to mitigate the spread. In this study, researchers in a controlled lab setting fed ticks with CWD-infected blood as well as infected brain matter and found that in both cases, ticks had the ability to shed CWD prions. So the way that transmission would likely occur in the wild is that it's common practice where deer will groom one another to pick ticks off each other, at which point the deer could consume and digest the infected tick. These researchers noted that there is need for future studies to determine whether or not this is occurring in nature, but if it turns out that ticks are spreading CWD and it's a significant vector, this will give biologists a better insight on how the disease moves across the landscape and hopefully better ways to control it. I think we're gonna continue to see some really interesting and hopefully helpful research related to CWD in the coming years. A lot of people are throwing a lot of money at it to try to understand and slow the spread. For the deeper dive this week, Randy and I are just talking about a few different news stories that recently popped up related to public lands and public access. For the deeper dive this week, it's just... Me and you. Yeah, it's just the two of us. Yeah, Michael and Jace are out. Chasing bears. Hopefully they hopefully they got one down. I hope so. I haven't, have you got a text message? I or got one yesterday midday. And that they were still struggling, but so we'll see. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully they're getting into them. Uh, well, Jace isn't but, one to give up easy, so yeah. No, I'm sure they're giving it all, yeah. all they have. So hopefully, we'll so get what, a report what, soon. What, what of the many issues that popped up in the last week, Marcus, have hit your headlines? Well, that's what we were talking about. Is just maybe we just do a kind of a public land, public access overview on of. A, of a few a recent headlines. Yeah. So maybe we're not going to dive too crazy deep into any of them in particular, but just kind of briefly talk about a few of them. Yeah, and know that they probably affect your hunting, your fishing, and your access. Right. So. Yeah, the one that was really interesting was there's potentially going to be some movement on how leases work on federal yeah. land yeah. as it relates to cattle grazing or oil and gas. Solar. And solar. Wind. Yeah. And uh, the way it was pitched, I believe, is that it'll, like, put conservation groups and conservation-minded leasing mm -hmm. uh, on an equal playing field right. with that of develop energy development or cattle grazing or the traditionally more consumptive uses right. of land. And so, yeah. I don't know. I, I'm curious what your thoughts I, are on it. You know, it <laughs> I, I can see why there are concerns. But if we want to go back to everyone saying, let the market, let, you know, let the free market really determine the best use of the land. Yeah. Why do some groups say we need free markets until we propose something that is going to make it more of a free market? 
Yeah. Then they're like, wait, wait, wait. So. Yeah, because I guess we should almost back up and, like, kind of explain a little bit about. So there's federal land. There's the right. BLM, Forest Service, mm -hmm. uh, a few other ones. But those right. are the big players big out west. Yep. And they will lease out land for cattle grazing. They'll lease it out for oil and gas development, so, uh, solar, yeah. wind, mining. which we've talked about in the past. Yeah, yeah. a lot of mining timber. stuff, timber. And so, so depending on, you know, what the yeah, land use is I'll, or what the land type is, uh, the uses can be different, and there's overlap yeah. too. Like you can have – you could have a, a mine or a gas well and also cattle grazing mm -hmm. happening concurrently. Right. But yep. they put that out for – a bid correct like the, uh, yeah most times it's it's you submit uh, well cattle grazing is a little different you have an allotment you have preference and so they just say here's what your rate is per aum animal unit per month right and, or animal unit month which is the amount of forage you count a calf pair or eat in a month and that's a standard amount. That's that, a, and it changes very right. minimal over the years. It's yeah, still the, a it's still a very low dollar amount. I think it's yeah. I for, it's still right. not more than two dollars, I believe. For oh no, it's an it, AUM. Yeah, it, and to put that in context, uh, a yeah. like a I don't know for, if it was if we were to go up on bid for like private land, private land is in, yeah in Montana. Say this is a boundary. You're going to pay twenty dollars per AUM on good quality private land right. and you're going to pay a buck 50 i think it is over here yeah around. buck 60 or something yeah so, so it's a pretty drastic difference and and yeah. i'll give it to them. some some of the bureau of land management land is a little less you know quality <laughs> than than some of the private yeah. stuff so but it, it it's definitely a it's a subsidy right. really it's a subsidy mm -hmm. to you know help these ranchers be able to graze the land yeah and yeah. i'm not necessarily saying it i like I, I sometimes trash talk it a little bit because it is it's kind of silly how big the difference is. Yeah. But, you know, there there's some other factors at play, which is Lots. one of my red flags or potential red flags, I should say. I, I, on the surface, I think this is kind of a cool idea, mm -hmm. the putting the conservation groups on equal footing to be able to right. bid for these things. But mm -hmm. one of my big red flags would be that are you going to put these – cattle ranchers out of business because of it and then it's kind of it goes back to the whole cows not condos argument right. where mm -hmm. if you put these cattle ranchers out of business then there might be less overall open space less wildlife habitat because maybe that deeded mm -hmm. ground that's next to their federal lease mm -hmm. they're now going to develop in some fashion or use it right. for some other thing that might be more detrimental to wildlife mm -hmm. than cattle grazing. I, I think that's a very legitimate concern, especially in the inner mountain areas where we are seeing such crazy amounts of development of critical wildlife habitat at this point. I don't want to see any of these working ranchers sell out to the out-of-state Wall Street billionaire. Right. Or say, well, I guess my last option is I'm just going to subdivide it all. Yeah. And put houses in here. It, so that, that's why I think uh, when you think this stuff through, you got to give it a little more thought. Your first gut, like mine, is like, hey, multiple use, right? That's why we have all these other activities. One of the multiple uses could be conservation use. Right. Let's make conservation one of the multiple uses that get considered. But how do you do that where somebody doesn't, say oh you know i'm pissed at this guy he let his cows out and it stepped on my tent the other day i'm me and my friends we're gonna go bid him out right and so i th i th i think everybody can see the hypocrisy when groups talk about free market and then when a free market opportunity idea, uh, yeah, yeah they protest it's like come on right uh but I do want to give a lot of thought, especially to how it affects people who are making a living on the land mm -hmm. and they add a lot of values that we as a society do value. We, we, we value open space. We, owe, we value wildlife habitat. Yeah. So if letting them graze cattle, which if done according to the allotment rules should not be just overly impactful to wildlife if there's a subsidy to that for them providing open space and, and all the other things it's like eh. yeah 
And then I, oh, the places we hunt in, say, Arizona, Nevada, New Mexico, if it wasn't for public land grazing, a lot of those places have lost their surface water. Because right, that's a the, whole other aspect to it. And so wildlife is way more, de- way more dependent on developed surface water of public land grazers in these arid states because their big cities have taken all their surface water. Or we have pinion juniper encroachment, which, what is it, 40 gallons a day each each I of don't those know the stats, but it's, some it's crazy a crazy number. Significant amount, yeah. And so as we've let that expand, we've lost most of our surface water that wildlife needs there. So it's, uh, I, uh, as a general rule, I agree with the idea. I think conservation is a valuable use of land and it should be up there with all the multiple uses. Right. But how do we do it smart? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you. That's a, that's a thing. It's just, my mind immediately goes to like trying to like, think about what unintended consequences could arise from this. Yeah. Because uh, to me, it's just like, yeah, you know, if some conservation group is going up to bid on an oil and gas or a potential oil and gas mm-hmm. lease with an oil company, I mean, like, yeah, that's kind of cool. Yeah. yeah, let free market dictate yeah. who could who could and get that. And if, you know, if the uh, conservation groups can raise enough money to make it happen, then I think but, that is kind of cool. Mm-hmm. But then on the flip side, your argument would be like, okay, well, then you're just exporting that energy development to somewhere else, to right. overseas, you know, and, right. and I get it. So well, I was trying to, I don't know, know, it's exciting to think about the yeah. possibilities, but then at the same time. So there was yeah. a, a lady in Utah, Mary Tempest Williams, mm-hmm. who did this in 2016. Her and her husband, there was like a thousand acres or something. She submitted for the oil and gas lease on some land. Yeah. And she won the bid. But then the BLM said, oh, we've heard these public comments that you don't intend to use it until it can be done in a sustainable way or something like that. So they withdrew the lease. Right. Which is kind of crazy. Like, So I, in some ways, the market, as much as it will displace where energy occurs, that might not be a bad thing because... What if the cost of solar development on public lands in migration corridors or critical sage grouse habitat, what if that got pushed to urban places? Because it, now it became cheaper for every rooftop and every parking lot and every building in Phoenix to have solar. Right. Because that was like kind of on a previous episode, we were talking about that mm-hmm. exact thing of it's just so cheap to develop solar and wind on, on public, public land. land. Right. Whereas it's, there's so many other places on, you know, maybe farmland, private land, on rooftops and cities that make more sense, like, from an environmental standpoint, yeah. but not a financial standpoint. No, and, and so that's th- right. this could, you know, <laughs> move the, you know, I, shift the swing the other way. Uh, that's where my mind first goes to it is, you know what, this is the free market giving a voice to these other values we place on these public lands. Because... Urban America has kind of treated the rural states as colonies. You go develop all the resources, you impact your air, your water, your landscapes, and make sure we got enough electricity, enough oil and gas, enough everything else, and we'll call it good. Well, this would push, maybe push some of that back to, okay, let's do it in your backyard. And then let's see how much you like it. Yeah, well, <laughs> I definitely want to continue to like, research this one yeah. more because it's it's super interesting. Yeah, um, and it 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 would like you said if it's the BLM and the and the Forest Service we're talking combined almost six hundred million acres that could be affected by that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So what if, what if indigenous tribes wanted to go and lease stuff so that you know let's use Alaska so that caribou migrations were com completely unaffected i don't know how much they're affected or not affected by right. energy development i don't know but what if they were allowed to go do that what i mean all of a sudden when you open this box it's a huge box right so yeah definitely going to continue to read up on that one yeah. um so what were so what were some of the other things you were looking uh, at? That you were well, there was a Colorado uh, stream access law yeah, that yeah. got decided by the Colorado Supreme Court. And I read the case last night, and it wasn't that they told the guy, you lost. They issued, I think it's called declaratory uh, judgment, 
It was a lot of legal mumbo jumbo yeah. that I didn't <laughs> fully understand, but... The best that I can make of it, and I'm sure an attorney is going to watch this and say, Newberg, stick to tax law, okay? Uh, but the court ruled that an individual does not have standing to make this claim. If anyone's going to make the claim that this is a state-owned uh, waterbed, you know, stream bed, the state makes that claim, not you as an individual. Now, it didn't, from what I read, it didn't say this individual couldn't go and sue the state to say, hey, you have to go and assert that this is state land or state property. Right, because he was suing an individual who had, or like a private landowner who had yeah. harassed him on the river. Yeah. It was, yeah, it's really confusing and like. Right, so I. And I, I, I don't even think the court really got into the real law of it. They mostly just said, look, you don't have standing. Right. So we can't have a case if you as the plaintiff don't have standing to bring the case. So uh, I'm reading, you know, all my news stuff that comes in, and a lot of folks are concerned about that, and I, I get it. You know, we're lucky in Montana. Well, you, most people would say we have the gold standard of stream access. Right. So. Yeah, and Colorado um, still is this kind of murky, weird yeah. thing. It lo- it was like <laughs> over the years it's just changed a little bit here and there. Like yeah. So they, they used to not be able to float yeah. through private property, but now they can float but not set foot on the stream bed yeah. on navigable streams and – Weird stuff. Yeah, yeah, there's all sorts of interesting <clears throat> aspects to it. In, in the last year, New Mexico and Utah also had decisions related to their stream access law. So yeah. point of bringing up the other states is this is a big issue. Right. And be paying attention. Get yeah. Involved. And well, Montana, even though we have awesome stream access laws right now for, uh, you know, from the perspective of a public access right. user, it's still constantly being threatened always so there anytime the legislature convenes there are a handful of people who show up there fully intent on trying to revamp montana's stream access law yeah and if you want to get the folks pissed in montana mess with their stream access yeah (laughs) Uh. so and then this last item you were talking about the the EPA, there was a new mm, yeah. rule change with the EPA. And I, yeah. I didn't see this one, so fill yeah. me in. So uh, the, the EPA has operated under a policy that says waters of America. In other words, where they have jurisdiction. And it gets into this discussion of, well, what waters do they have jurisdiction over? Uh, the EPA, the Corps of Engineers, or any federal agency, what, what do they have Is it just navigable waters? Is it navigable waters and attached surfaces? What about wetlands? And this this case mostly had to do with I think the name of the the group the was called Sackett. Uh, As of course a case from northern Idaho just up here, where they were filling in a wetland to build something, if I understand correctly. And one of the federal agencies said, "Hey, wait a second, you you can't destroy a wetland." Mm And so it went to the to the court, and the court said, uh, "Well, that's outside the scope of what we deem to be the waters of America." And so I'm in my mind thinking, "So okay, a wetland may not be a surface, a navigable surface water that goes to a river or to another lake or something that is navigable." R- what does this mean? For wetlands. Yeah. Well, that's what I was wondering because, I mean, obviously water flows downhill. Yeah. So, like, at the tops of watersheds, <laughs> you're obviously what you do at the beginning mm-hmm. of that. Right. Even though the wetland might not directly flow right into a river, it's gonna, it can still have downstream consequences, yeah. whatever you do there. Right. And so, all these head, you know, headwaters here and mountain areas, those aren't navigable. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And no, it's even just like the, small little tributaries. Yeah. And a lot of them sit up in mountain basins and they seep out of there. Not that in our wilderness areas we have that worry, but, you know, what about mining that Montana has this terrible legacy of mines 
mining activity, destroying right. water. Over here in Butte, Anaconda, the largest Superfund site in the United States is there. And we're dealing with that legacy. We're dealing with it up in Zortman with the Pegasus, oh, yeah. Landusky Pegasus gold mine that left. So for me, it's like, okay, I, I get you're trying to provide some delineation here so people can operate and say, okay, I'm either in waters of the, the under this waters of the U.S. theory or I'm outside it. Yeah. They're saying, well, we're going to scope it way down. So that leaves more unprotected waters. Yeah, it's it's frustrating because uh, I I mean I get it we need we need to right mine we need development we need, we happens need, but right. there like history has shown that there has been some really bad consequences mm-hmm. from not planning ahead yeah. like you, the examples you just mentioned yeah and I know there's now uh, current there was a I just saw an article I did I didn't read too much into it but uh. They're develop or not developing, but exploring the upper reaches of the Bitterit watershed for some mining exploration. Really? So that's just like at the very beginning stages. Like I don't think they're. That, I think yeah. that was the announcement is that they are. There's intent to ex- explore <laughs> the mm-hmm. upper reaches of the Bitterit. Yeah, and so that's like uh, you know, it still happens all the time. It's just there's a lot more checks and balances. Hopefully, yeah, that you know occur in order for something to happen. But it's just like. Yeah, but water history definitely teaches some lessons that we don't always learn. That's, <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah, it's like we're in denial because water is one of the well, one, it's the most valuable resource we have. Yeah. It's scarce in a lot of places. It is transient. It as much as people want to say, well, that water just stays on my property. No, it doesn't. Right. So now you extrapolate where this case that just came out, there's been a lot of restrictions on ag businesses that have a lot of effluent you know if you run a big dairy operation or a turkey operation or a pig operation oh yeah you got a lot of people pooping and peeing not people but critters what do you do with that well a lot of them have had containment ponds but do you want that easing into the wetland which then eases into the creek that becomes the city's water supply right well, another one is golf courses, like all of the fertilizers going on golf uh, courses and all of that nitrogen ending up in the system. It's, yeah, yeah there's so, a lot of pollution that happens. I, it, it's crazy. Yeah, but, I, I'm not smart enough to have the answer, yeah. but I have, I mean, I was alive when the Cuyahoga River started on fire <laughs> in Ohio. And uh, I can't believe how clean the water in America has gotten in my lifetime. As a kid, I remember going to a lot of fishing places that said, do not eat these fish. This water is in effect. Oh, saying, yeah. This water is so bad, eating these fish will make you sick. Over time, the Clean Water Act has brought us to where we are today, where I think we take clean water for granted. Yeah. Wasn't always this way. No. And do we want to go... Uh, Read the history of the Clark Fork River. That's like, yeah. uh, like you mentioned. Does anyone want dirtier water? Oh, my, you know, this water is just too damn clean, Marcus. We need some dirtier water around here. That'll solve some problem. Right. I, but yeah, that's one that I, everyone is saying, oh, it's no big deal. It's no big deal, blah, blah, blah. And I hope it turns out to not be a big deal. But as someone who treasures our wetlands, understands the value of, of wetlands and headwater, uh, you know, water sources, I, I got my skepticisms. Yeah. So. Well, thanks for yeah. giving us the, the lowdown on a few of those yeah. public land, public access issues. So. Yeah. So but hopefully, hopefully Jason and Michael have shot a bear yeah hopefully get an update next week you yeah. probably won't be part of next week's episode no. unless you get back early but no, uh we'll, be. yeah Leupold's, we'll be back at it with something yeah Leupold's invited me to one of their shooting academies Ooh, they must have, they must have looked at some of my shooting and <laughs> said hey of all the guys we got let, let's get newberg out here to this academy <laughs> Well, you can always improve. Yeah. Uh, Cool stuff, Marcus. Thanks for bringing it all up. Oh, yeah. Thanks for joining me. Yep. All right.